recording. All right, so brain needs glucose and oxygen. Insulin is necessary for glucose to enter the cells. Without enough insulin, the cells do not get fed. And I will repeat, brain cells do not require insulin to get glucose. They can absorb it directly. Everywhere else in the body requires insulin, right? So all the other cells in other areas of the body will need insulin in order to, to pick up the glucose. The pancreas produces and stores glucagon and insulin. So in the pancreas, we have the, the islets of Langerhans, which have alpha and beta cells. There are other cells at the top, but we won't go into it for this on the level of this course. The alpha cells produce glucagon and glucagon will come out or be, be produced when, when the glucose level is low in the blood, right? So when the glucose level is low in the blood, alpha cells will produce glucagon. The glucagon will convert glycogen that is stored by the liver into glucose. Very important for you to understand that. So again, when the blood sugar is low, glucagon will be produced. When glucagon is produced by the alpha cells, it converts glycogen that is stored in the liver to glucose. The beta cells produce insulin. Insulin will come out when there is a elevated level of glucose in the blood, right? And it will allow some of that glucose to pass in to the cell to meet the, the cell needs. Whatever remains as excess, it will convert that to glycogen and store it in the liver. Right? So insulin will convert excess glucose to glycogen and store it in the liver. Now pathophysiology, diabetes mellitus, and that's what we will be the focus for this chapter. There is another diabetes, it's called diabetes insipidus, but you do not need to know about that condition for this um, course, because there's not much you can do for that patient. Diabetes mellitus impairs the body's ability to use glucose for fuel, right? So it is the, the body the body's unable to utilize carbohydrates for the purpose of energy, right? Body can't utilize glucose. It occurs in about 9.3% of the population. Without treatment, blood glucose levels become too high. In severe cases, it may cause life-threatening illness or coma and death. And numerous complications can arise from the, the disease or the condition. Complications include blindness, cardiovascular disease, kidney problems, problem with the blood vessels, all the stuff can arise. Now, you need to know the signs and symptoms of glucose, right? That is high glucose levels, which is hyperglycemia. So that's too much glucose in the blood. And you have low, which is hypoglycemia, which is low levels of glucose in the blood. Now, hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia can occur with diabetes mellitus type 1 and type 2. So you have two types of diabetes. You have type 1 
and you have type 2. And regardless of whether the patient has type 1 or type 2, they can have issues with the blood sugar being too high, or they can have issues with the blood sugar being too low. Now, a patient with type 1 diabetes is a patient who is unable to produce insulin. So that patient cannot produce insulin. So for some reason, their body has destroyed the, the, the beta cells of the islets of longer hands on the pancreas. So their body is attacking itself, basically, right? And so because of that, they're unable to produce insulin. So this is a patient who will require insulin daily, right? Um, it used to be called juvenile diabetes because it's common in the pediatric population. So that's type one. Type one patient cannot produce insulin. The type two patient is the patient that is, this patient is capable of producing insulin, but is the insulin that they're producing might not be enough. So it might not be enough, or the insulin that they're producing is not working properly, right? So it might not be enough, or the insulin is not working Properly. So these patients will be tend to be more on medication, tablet medications, right? So that's the difference between type 1, type 2. Type 1 produces no insulin, right? Type 2 can, can produce insulin, but it's either not enough or it's not working properly. And whether the patient has type 1, or type 2, they can have low blood sugar or high blood sugar. Yes, Ms. Nesbitt. Sir, um, with type 2 diabetes as well, sir, I think the, the, the cells, they don't have the receptors to, to take up the insulin that is produced. So the insulin just sits there without being utilized because there's an increased resistance to the insulin moving in, right? Okay. Noted. Where am I? Hold on. All right. Now, diabetes mellitus type one. It's an autoimmune disorder where the immune system produces antibodies against the pancreatic beta cells. These are the cells that produce insulin. Missing the pancreatic hormone insulin. Without insulin, glucose cannot enter the cell and the cell cannot produce energy. So they need insulin. Onset usually happens from early childhood through the fourth decade of life. Immune system destroys the ability of the pancreas to produce insulin. The patient must obtain insulin from an external source. Patients with type one diabetes cannot survive without insulin. They have different types of insulin. You have fast acting, um, intermediate and long acting insulin. Patients who inject insulin often need a blood glucose level check daily, right? So they need to check their blood sugar quite um, often. <clears throat> Many people with type one diabetes have an implanted insulin pump. I cannot say that I have seen that in Jamaica. I've definitely seen um, seen it in the States. Continuously measures glucose levels and provide, provides insulin, limits the number of times patients have to check their fingers to glucose level. It can malfunction and it can and that can lead to a diabetic emergency. Always inquire about the presence of an insulin pump. 
Right. Now, the most common metabolic disease of the child. Um, <clears throat> new onset patient will have sins related to eating and drinking, right? And you will see the classic three Ps. So let me see if I can use my pencil for a sec. Colors. All right. Um, let me draw a line here. All right. So. Uh, All right, so let me put a text here. This would be, so one, mm -mm, won't work here. All right, that's not gonna work. All right, everybody can see that line that I, I draw. Everybody seen the block line? Yes, sir. That's all right. All right, good. Now, on this side of the black line, we have glucose molecules. So this is a blood cell, right? So this is a blood with the glucose molecules. This is the cell. This is a, you have a type one diabetic patient. So the patient cannot produce any insulin, right? So the patient has glucose in the blood. The cell need the glucose, but there is no insulin present, right? There's no insulin present. So what is gonna happen at this point is the cell need insulin, so it has to be pulled from somewhere, right? They have to get that, that sugar or energy to function. <clears throat> now, with a type 1 diabetic, the, bo the body is going to go for reserve, right? So the body is going to go for reserve. And the first place it's going to go to is the, the liver, right? So the glyco glycogen will be produced, uh, sorry, glucagon will be produced and glucagon will convert the glycogen to glucose. So what is gonna happen is we will get more glucose building up. So we start to get more glucose building up, right? And if we start to get more glucose building up, inside of the blood, what is gonna happen to the blood sugar? Anybody know? Anybody have an answer? Yes, Miss Nesbitt. You will get hyperglycemia. So the patient is going to start to get hyperglycemia. Now, if the cell is still not getting sugar, the, would this patient be, would this patient start to feel hungry? Anybody can answer yes, that? Sir. Yeah. Right, so the patient is going to start to get hungry. And that is the, the polyphasia phase, right? That's the polyphasia phase, phase. <clears throat> excessive eating or swallowing. Now, how is the body, what, if there's a high concentration of glucose molecules inside the blood in comparison to the cell, where would water be put? Water will be pulled into the blood cell. Right. So we're going to start to get water being pulled outside of the cell, right? So water will be pulled in this 
direction. Starting to get water being pulled. So the cell will start to dehydrate or shrink. This is the, the polydipsia. That's the excessive thirst, right? And the body is going to try and get rid of this excess glucose in the blood by increasing the urine output. That's the polyuria, right? So that's the three Ps. Polyuria, polydipsia, polyphasia. Now, after the body goes to the liver, right? To get the reserves. Even though there is more glucose molecules present, <clears throat> the cell is still not getting the glucose molecules. <clears throat> So eventually what is going to happen is the body will now do fat, right? So the body is going to try and break down fat to create energy. And a byproduct of that is ketones, right? And when that starts to accumulate in the blood, the pH becomes more acidic. So this patient is at risk for going into what we would call diabetic ketoacidosis, right? <clears throat> so this is a patient that you will find with a, a high blood sugar, rapid, deep breathing, and a, a unusual odor on the breath, right? They have a, an unusual odor. Um, and everybody describes it differently. It smells like nail polish removal. That's what it smells like to me the first time I smelt it, right? <clears throat> because the body is going into a metabolic acidotic state. So that would be diabetic ketoacidosis. So the type one diabetic patient would be at risk for that, right? So once no insulin is present, the body will go to the liver, to get um, the, the glucose through the conversion of um, glycogen via glucagon. But no insulin still not present, then the body's gonna break down fat. Once the fat starts to break down, we get ketones as a byproduct, and that can cause the pH to become more acidic. <clears throat> All right, let's clear this up. All right, so new onset patient will have symptoms related to eating and drinking. Polyuria, polydipsia, polyphasia, weight loss, fatigue. When a patient's blood glucose level is above normal, the kidney's filtration system becomes overwhelmed and glucose spills into the urine. And if some of this urine um, spills on the ground, after a while you'll see ants um, going towards it. So polyuria, frequent urination, polydipsia, increase in fluid consumption. They start to get thirsty because Water is being pulled out of the cells. Polyphasia, severe hunger, and increased food intake. Not getting, the cell not getting any sugar, you will get hungry, right? Now, when glucose is unavailable to the cells, the body turns to fat, right? This produces acid waste ketones. A key, as ketones go up in the blood, they spill into the urine. Kidneys cannot maintain acid-base balance. The patient breathes faster and deeper. The body attempts to reduce acid level by releasing more carbon dioxide through the lungs. So this is known as Kuzmal respirations. So it's rapid, deep respirations with an unusual odor, right? It's not bad breath. That's not what it smells like. <clears throat> now, 
if fat metabolism and ketone production continue, this will ultimately lead to diabetic ketoacidosis, right? May present as generalized illness plus abdominal pain, body aches, nausea, vomiting, altered mental status, or unconsciousness. Now, the difference with hype when the sugar is high on, on, in comparison to when it's low is the signs and symptoms gradually progress when the patient has a high blood sugar. When they have a low blood sugar, the signs and symptoms occur much faster, right? So keep that in mind. Now, if not recognized and treated, DKA can result in death. When a patient with DKA has altered mental status, ask your friends about the patient's history and presentation. Obtain a glucose level with a finger stick using a lancet and a glucometer, generally higher than 400 milligrams per deciliter. <clears throat> now, that's type one. Let's look at type two. Diabetes mellitus type 2 caused by resistance to the effects of insulin at the cellular level. Association between obesity and increased res resistance to the effects of insulin. So um, persons that are obese are at risk and the reason is, is um, pretty straightforward because of the, the layers, the multiple layers it is difficult for the insulin to pass through all of those layers to get to the cell because of the, the fat. So they are at risk for, for diabetes. The pancreas produces more insulin to make up for the increased levels of blood glucose and dysfunction of cellular insulin receptors. Insulin resistance can sometimes be improved by exercise and dietary modification. Oral medications are used to treat type 2 diabetes. Some increase secretion of insulin and cause a high risk of hypoglycemic reaction, or sometimes referred to that as insulin shock. Others decrease the effects of glucagon and decrease the release of glucose stored in the liver. Injectable medications and insulin are also used for type 2 diabetes. Right. Now, often diagnosed at a yearly medical examination from complaints related to high blood glucose level, including recurrent infection, changes, in vision, numbness in the, the feet. All right, now let's look at symptomatic hyperglycemia. I remember, whether it's one or type two, they can have high or low blood sugar. Occurs when the blood glucose levels are high, the patient is in a state of altered mental status resulting from several combined problems. In type 1 diabetes, this leads to ketoacidosis with dehydration. So the patient with type 1 has two issues. The electrolyte um, imbalance is present and there is dehydration. If it is type 2, because the, there is still some, some insulin that can enter the cell but not enough is entering, the body don't need to go to the liver or break down fat, so they won't get um, ketone um, the, um, forming. So the main issue with the type 2 diabetic patient when the blood sugar goes up is going to be dehydration, right? And that is referred to as non-ketotic hyperosmolar state of dehydration, right? Just remember, say, if I type 2, the main issue is going to be dehydration. Type 1, they have an electrolyte balance, right? 
and they have dehydration. If an individual has hyperglycemia for a protracted length of time, consequences of diabetes, diabetes may be present. So wound will not heal properly, right? Because blood vessels will be, will be damaged over time. Numbness in the hands and feet, they start to have nerve problems, can have blindness, they can have issues with the kidneys, they can have gastric motility problems. When blood glucose levels are not controlled in diabetes mellitus type 2, they will get hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar, non ketotic syndrome or coma. That's HHNS. Key signs and symptoms of HHNS include hyperglycemia, altered mental status, drowsiness, lethargy, <coughs> severe dehydration, thirst, dark urine, visual or sensory deficits, partial paralysis or muscle weakness, and they can have seizures. Higher glucose levels in the blood cause the excretion of glucose in the urine. Patients respond by increasing their fluid intake, which causes polyuria. Patient cannot drink enough fluid to keep up with the exceedingly high glucose levels in the blood. Urine becomes dark and concentrated. Patient may become unconscious or have seizure activity due to severe dehydration. Now, let's look at symptomatic hypoglycemia. So this is a low blood sugar. First important thing you need to note, acute emergency. It is a sudden emergency. Acute emergency in which a patient's blood glucose level drops and must be corrected promptly or swiftly, right? So we have to correct this problem as soon as possible as they can have brain damage. Can occur in patients who inject insulin or use oral medications that stimulate the pancreas to produce more insulin, right? So they have too much insulin in the body, not enough glucose. When insulin levels remain high, glucose is rapidly taken out of the blood. If glucose levels fall, there may be an insufficient amount to supply the brain. Mental status will start to de decline as a result. Patient may become aggressive or they may display unusual behavior. So they can become combative or they can display unusual behavior. Unconsciousness and permanent brain damage can quickly follow. Common reasons for low blood glucose level to develop. Correct dose of insulin with change in routine. More insulin than necessary. So they take more insulin than they actually need. Correct dose of insulin without the patient eating a sufficient amount of food. Take the right dose, but they're not eating enough. Correct dose of insulin and the patient develops an acute illness where that can use up the, the reserves that they have. Hypoglycemia develops much more quickly than hyperglycemia. In some instances, it can occur in a matter of minutes. Now, the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Normal to shallow or rapid respiration. Pale, moist skin. Diaphoresis. Dizziness. Headache. Rapid pulse normal to low blood pressure. They can have altered mental status. They can be anxious or combative. They can have seizures, fainting, can be in a coma state, weakness on one side of the body, so they can mim mimic a stroke patient. 
rapid changes in mental status. Now, this chart, very important chart, right? So the normal levels are considered between 80 to 120 milligrams per deciliter. That's what they use in the, the states. Out here we use millimoles, right? Millimoles per liter. <clears throat> and if you want to convert milligrams to millimoles, you divide it by 80. So you divide the milligrams by 18 to convert it to millimoles. And if you want to convert millimoles to milligrams, you multiply by 18. So we use millimoles in Jamaica. So the normal range is 80 to 120. In some books, you might say 70 to 120 milligrams per deciliter. Low 80 is hypoglycemia. So between 40 and 80, it's hypoglycemia. Below 40, it's hypoglycemic crisis or insulin shock. Right? And usually below 40, yet the mental status has changed significantly or the patient is unresponsive or semi-responsive at that point. Hypoglycemia is quickly reversed by giving the patient glucose. Without glucose, the patient can sustain permanent brain damage. So time is important. Time is very important. All right, so that's a part of physiology. Let's look at the patient assessment. So in your scene size up, scene safety. Patients with diabetes may use syringes, so you have to make sure you're looking out for that, right? Be alert for clues, use standard precautions. Question bystanders on events leading, leading up to your arrival. Keep open the possibility that trauma may have occurred, right? So definitely need to consider MOI and NOI. MOI for suspecting trauma, NOI for medical conditions. Your primary assessment phase, this is where you will manage immediate and potential life threats. Right? So you're going to assess and manage. You form a general impression of the patient, you form a general impression of the environment that you find the patient in. You will assess the patient's level of consciousness and you will assess the upper airway and the lower airway. Is the patient showing signs of inadequate breathing or pulse oximetry levels less than or equal to 94% or they have altered mental status? Then you definitely need to put them on side flow oxygen between 12 to 15 liters per minute. Hyperglycemic patients may have cosmal respiration and sweet fruity breath. Hypoglycemic patients will have normal or shallow to rapid respiration. Very important slide. Manage respiratory distress. Once you have assessed the upper airway and lower airway and you have managed the airway accordingly, next is your circulation assessment. In circulation, dry warm skin is more hyperglycemia. Moist pale skin is more hypoglycemia, right? Rapid weak pulse is symptomatic hypoglycemia. Very important slides. These are very important slides. After you have assessed your circulation, which would include the pulse, peripheral pulse if your patient is responsive, central pulse if the patient is not, you look at the color in the palms, you can look at the skin color around the mouth or the mucous membranes, right? You check the skin temperature quickly to see if the patient feels hot, warm and dry, cool and clammy, right? We don't need an actual temperature at that point. Also, 
keeping in the back of your mind that if nobody's there that can tell you what's going on, you check to see if the patient is bleeding anywhere, right? Or showing signs of internal bleeding. Once you have done your circulation, you should at this point know what your patient's GCS is, whether or not you have a load and go patient, whether or not you need to do a rapid scan or a focus assessment. Right? So you're gonna make a transport decision. Provide transport for patients with altered mental status and inability to swallow. Further evaluate conscious patients capable of swallowing and able to maintain airway. After we have completed ABCs, the next phase is history taking. And I always say to my students or EMT, once your patient is talking, sample history first, vital signs after. The patient is not talking to you, vital signs first, consider um, physical findings and whether or not you can get any history at that point. So investigate the chief complaint. This can come directly from the patient, it can come from family members, it can come from bystanders, it can come from seeing. If the patient has eaten but not taken insulin, hyperglycemia is more likely. If the patient has taken insulin but not eaten, hypoglycemia is more likely. Carefully observe signs and symptoms for determine whether hypo or hyperglycemic. All right, so your sample history. Ask the patient things that you need to ask or should consider asking. Do you take insulin or pills to lower your blood sugar? Do you wear an insulin pump? Is it working properly? Have you taken your usual insulin dose or pills? Have you eaten normally today? Have you had an illness, unusual amounts of activity or stress? All right, so that's your history phase. After we have completed the history phase, the next phase is the secondary assessment. This is where we will do our recordable signs and or detailed systematic assessment or focus systematic assessment. Physical examination. Assess responsive patients from head to toe. When you suspect a diabetes-related problem, focus on mental status, ability to swallow, and ability to protect the airway. So we want vitamins. Use a glucometer if available and protocols allow. And I think every BLS unit should have a glucometer on board. Right? It is something for an EMT to know how to, to, to use. It is important. Hypoglycemia, respirations are normal to rapals is weak and rapid and skin is typically pale and clammy with low blood pressure. Hyperglycemia, respirations may be deep and rapid pulse may be rapid, weak, and thready, and the skin may be warm and dry with normal blood pressure. <clears throat> Portable glucometer, you should have that in your jump bag. Study the operator's manuals for proper use in it. So make sure you're familiar with the glucometer you have on your unit. Make sure you check the battery before you start your duty. Make sure you have a backup battery right don't wait until you have a situation to discover that the battery is dead and ensure that your your code strips match what is on the match machine know the upper and lower ranges at which your glucometer functions normal non-fasting adult and child blood glucose level range from 80 to 120 milligrams per deciliter. Neonates should be above 70 milligrams per deciliter. Now, after your secondary assessment, 
reassessed. Reassess frequently, provide indicated interventions. Hypoglycemic conscious patient can swallow, encourage patients to take glucose tablets or drink juice containing sugar. Administer highly concentrated sugar gel if protocol allows. So if your protocol allows you to give the glucose gel, give it to the patient. Provide rapid transport. If the patient is unconscious or at risk for aspiration, patient requires intravenous glucose, which that would be dextrose, or intramuscular IM or IN glucagon beyond EMT competencies. When in doubt, consult medical control. Right now, this is a hot topic in Jamaica. So it can be, you can give a patient that is not responding glucose orally, but it has to be done a specific way, right? Anyway, the test textbook answer for the question is if the patient is unconscious or at risk for aspiration, no oral glucose. Yes, Ms. Nesbeck, go ahead. What is done in Jamaica? What, huh? is, done, what is done in Jamaica that is controversial, sir? What do you mean, what is done in Jamaica that is controversial? If you have an unresponsive diabetic patient showing sign of hypoglycemia, what is mm -hmm. done oh. in Jamaica? There's no protocol in Jamaica. I was saying that it is a controversial topic. There's no protocol in Jamaica, you know. So what, uh -huh. they, what the EMTs have been doing, which is poor management, is um, empty the glucose in the box, because we don't have the gel in Jamaica. Empty the glucose in the patient's mouth while they're in a supine position. That's madness, right? That shows a lack, a lack of knowledge, and it shows that you're panicking, right? So it can be done, it needs to be done sensibly, right? So if I have a, a unresponsive or semi-responsive patient with a low blood sugar, and there's no complications for me to keep it, this patient in a supine position, I'm gonna turn the patient in a recovery position, right? or turn the head to the side. And the portion, the side of the head that is close to the stretcher, that's where I'm gonna work. So what I would do is I would put in a bite block in the patient's mouth so that they don't bite my finger. And I would use a bite stick, put the, the glucose powder on it. Not a lot, you don't need to put a lot. And you can wet it with maybe a mill of fluid. And then you just rub that in the cheek. Rub it in the cheek. And you gradually do that until your patient wakes up. That's how I would give uh, unresponsive or semi-responsive patient glucose orally. And it's really the buckle that you're using. <clears throat> you're using the mucous membranes in the, the cheek. And so I will, would do it, but it's not being done like that, right? And if you do it any other way, you're going to put the patient's earway at risk. So you have to make sure that if you're doing it, you don't put the patient's earway at risk. It does make sense their blood sugar go up and they don't have an earway. So that's my answer to that question. But there is no protocol to guide its administration, right? Because most of the, the EMS services that operate in Jamaica do so without medical direction, proper medical direction. All right, now, if unable to test for blood glucose value, perform a thorough assessment, contact the hospital to help sort of signs and symptoms. Now, 
the information I just gave to you is not the answer to the question, right? So if if the patient, if you see a question in your exam that says your patient is unresponsive or semi-responsive, you do not give glucose orally. That's the answer, right? That is the textbook answer. But experiences teaches you otherwise. All right. Now, communication and documentation. Coordinate communication and documentation. Inform receiving us hospital about the patient's history, the present situation, your assessment findings, and your interventions and your results. Patients who refuse transport after symptoms improve may require even more um, thorough documentation. All right, so emergency medical care for diabetic emergencies. Giving oral glucose, you have three types. So you have the rapidly dissolving gel, large chewable tablets, and you have the liquid form of glucose. Out here, we have the powder, what you're gonna see on most of the, the ambulances in Jamaica, the glucose powder. That they used that they put on orange when we used to do track and field. I don't know if them still do that, but in my days, them used to put glucose on the orange and give you after you don't run. <clears throat> Oral glucose contraindications inability to swallow, unconsciousness, wear gloves before putting anything in the patient's mouth, right? And I, as I say, I will. Create a bite block using the the oral earway where I put it, put the, the flange end inside of the mouth instead of putting the earway itself. So it becomes a, a bite block. I will teach you these things in the classroom setting. Follow local protocols for glucose administration. Right? So you, you have to be guided by a protocol. We don't function independently. Request, sorry, reassess frequently, provide transport. All right, now presentation of hypoglycemia. Seizures should be considered very serious. Possible causes, infection, poisoning, hypoglycemia, trauma, increased level of oxygen, idiopathic unknown cause, fever or undiagnosed epilepsy in children, All right? All right, seizures may indicate an underlying condition. Your priority is to keep the airway clear. Once not contraindicated, put the patient on their side. Put nothing in the patient's mouth, have suction and equipment ready, provide oxygen if needed, or assisted ventilation or artificial ventilation if the patient has inadequate ventilation with cyanosis. Transport promptly. For altered mental status, may be caused by other conditions, poisoning, head injury, postictal state, decreased brain perfusion, may be caused by diabetes complication. Use a new AEIOU tips. <clears throat> Your priority, keep the airway clear, be prepared to suction, be prepared to provide artificial ventilations and rapid transport. Misdiagnosis of neurologic dysfunction symptoms may be mistaken for intoxication. So a patient with hypoglycemia may appear as if they are drunk, especially with that um, unusual order, if it's hyperglycemia, I should say. All right, a diabetic patient confined by police is at risk. 
Look for emergency medical identification, bracelet, necklace, or card. Perform blood glucose tests at scene. If your protocol allows, diabetes and alcoholism can coexist in a patient. And that patient might be difficult to treat. Relationship to airway management. Patients with altered mental status can lose their gag reflex. Vomit or tongue may obstruct the airway. Carefully monitor the airway. Place the patient in lateral recumbent position. It is not contraindicated because if you have to breathe for the patient, you're going to have to do that with the patient in a supine position. Make sure suction is available. All right, so that's diabetic emergencies. Let's look at hematologic, hematologic emergencies. Hematology is a study of blood-related disease. Three disorders can cause pre-hospital emergency. Sickle cell disease, hemophilia A, A sorry, and thrombophilia. Anatomy and physiology. The blood is made up of four components. Each serve a purpose. Red blood cells contain hemoglobin, which carries oxygen to the tissues. White blood cells collect dead cells and provide for their correct disposal. Platelets are essential for clot formation. Plasma serves as the transporting medium. <clears throat> sickle cell is an inherited disorder. It affects red blood cells. So with sickle cells, the red blood cells don't form properly. They have a sickle cell. They have a sickle shape, which sickle is a device that they use to cut. Um, farmers use it back in the day to cut. A or I'm not sure if it's hay they cut, but they use it to cut stuff back in the days. I can't remember exactly what. Right, so it it looks like a, a half moon shape. Right, so the cell is not nice and old. so because of that, it's not able to to hold all the the oxygen molecule. It is not well oxygenated. It the cell also doesn't live very long if it has a sickle cell shape and it doesn't travel smoothly can go to various places in the body and get stuck so that's sickle cell in a nutshell so sickle cell disease inherited disorder affects red blood cells predominantly in people of african caribbean and south american ancestry People with sickle cell disease have mishappen RBCs that lead to dysfunction in oxygen binding and unintentional clot formation, right? Cannot facilitate all the oxygen molecules and they don't move around very well. So they can have oxygen deficiency issues and clotting problems. Clots may result in a blockage known as vaso-occlusive crisis can result in hypoxia, pain, and organ damage. Sickle cell disease, sickle cells have a short lifespan resulting in more cellular waste products and contributing to sludging of the blood. Complications include anemia, gallstones, jaundice, splenic dysfunction. Now, sickle cell disease, vascular occlusion with ischemia, they can have acute chest syndrome where they are actually having um, chest pain, stroke, joint necrosis, pain crisis, acute or chronic organ dysfunction or failure, mental hemorrhages, increased risk of infection. So they are at a high risk for infection. Many of these complications are very, very painful and potentially life-threatening, all right? Now, let's look at clotting disorders. Hemophilia. Rare, only about 20% of Americans have the disorder. Yes, Ms. Nesbeth? Sir, um, before you move on to hemophilia, 
a lot of times in like in the male patients, the male sickle cell patients are mm-hmm. as well, which um, if that is present, it can be a very sensitive issue to, to a male patient, sir. Right? It is indeed. Yes, it is. It is. It is sensitive. Right? But, um, and this is where we, we have to be professional in our um, conduct around the patient, and we have to um, respect the patient's privacy and try to, to minimize any environment as much as possible. So yes, that is something that can occur. By the way, we know what prior prism is. We should, if we have read the spinal injury chapter, head and spine injuries. All right, now clotting, that, clotting disorders, hemophilia. Rare, only about 20,000 Americans have the disorder. Hemophilia affects mostly males. Hold on, let me backtrack a bit. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so hemophilia is decreased ability to create a clot after an injury, which can be life threatening. So the patient is having issues forming clots because um, factors, clotting factors, some clotting factors are missing. Patients typically have intravenous factor eight replacement infusion, which help the blood clot either close at hand or with them. <clears throat> I can need a glass of water. Okay. All right. I think my my laptop has decided to freeze at this point in time. So, if you can hear me, take a 10 minute break because I will have to log out and maybe log back in. Take a 10 minute break. a 10 minute break. You didn't hear me before. <laughs> <laughs> 